You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, Internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. Hey, this is John Preston, Marine Combat Veteran and Pacific Records Recording Artist. Hi, just reaching out to have you check out our new album, Battle Cry, Songs of America's Heroes, an album featuring phenomenal other combat veteran artists like Scott Brown of the Scooter Brown Band, Brian Weaver, Rowdy Johnson, just an incredible mix of people. This is all veterans telling our stories and our lives, and we're giving 100% of our proceeds to the Valkyrie Initiative to help veterans and first responders integrate back into society. I, myself, I've battled with post-traumatic stress for many years and lost my own brother, a Marine Corps veteran, to suicide. I ask that you step with us and make this happen. We are in pre-order right now and release on March 17th. Go to iTunes, go to Amazon, buy, buy, buy. We plan on making the charts and making it at a very high level, and your support right now makes a difference. This is the release of my new song, Superman Falls, which is actually about the loss of my own brother, which happened last year. And I would love for everyone to check it out, to listen, and hopefully it'll make a difference in many lives. If you're 85 or younger, would you like peace of mind and comfort for your family? We're Final Expense Direct with an urgent message for you. The average funeral today costs over $8,000, but the most you'll get from government benefits is $255. How will your family pay the difference? We can help. Our senior plans start as low as just a dollar a day and pay up to $30,000 for a funeral and other final expenses. Peace of mind is easy. There's no medical exam. You'll have lifetime coverage, and your plan can't be canceled as long as you pay your premiums. Call now for free information about our senior plans. Answer a few simple questions and receive approval right on the phone. Plus, call right now, and we'll give you a discount prescription card for free. Call 800-553-8687. That's 800-553-8687. Again, 800-553-8687. 687. This is Slickery Trigger for Rebel Road Tactical. With proper care and feeding, your pistol will be ready when you need it. There to save your life. Shouldn't your gear be that good? Whether you need a holster for comfortable everyday carry or a tough as nails holster for your next training course, Rebel Road Tactical has what you need. Check us out on the web at rebelroadtactical.com. Sometimes riders feel lost, unsure why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our riding into full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable riders to develop and grow, offering manuscript critiques and line edits through a mentoring editorial style. We also offer assistance on generating a rider's bio for your websites. Black Wolf Editorial Services, nurturing your riding into maturity. For a full list of services, visit blackwolfeditorial.com. Here's George Foreman with InventHelp. Hi, I'm George Foreman. Do you have an idea for a new product or invention? People ask me all the time, George, how do I get my idea in front of companies? How do I get a patent? What do I do next? Do you have the same questions? I'll tell you like I'll tell them all. Call my friends at InventHelp. Call InventHelp today for free information. InventHelp has been helping inventors for more than 30 years and has sales offices nationwide. InventHelp can submit your invention to companies who are interested in receiving new ideas. If you have an idea and want to try to patent it and submit it to companies, you should call InventHelp today for free information. Listen, I can't guarantee a company will be interested in your idea, but I believe every inventor deserves the opportunity to step into the ring and take their best shot. Put InventHelp in your corner. Get your free inventor's information. Call 1-800-353-6490. That's 1-800-353-6490. Again, 1-800-353-6490. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com.
You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, Internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, It is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes, And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new gods for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having indirect object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has refused his assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance. Unless suspended in their operation, till his assent should be obtained. And when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people unless those people would relinquish their right of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them and formidable to tyrants only. 
He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. He has refused for a long time, after such dissolutions, to cause others to be elected, whereby the legislative power, incapable of annihilation, have returned to the people at large for their exercise, the state remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of invasion from without and convulsions within. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states, for that purpose obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of land. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amounts and payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. He has kept among us, in times of peace, standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. He has affected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our Constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation, for quartering large bodies of armed troops among us, for protecting them by a mock trial from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states, for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury, for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses, for abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies, for taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our government, for suspending our own legislatures and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burned our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He is at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the work of death, desolation, and tyranny already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy, scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages and totally unworthy the head of a civilized nation. He has constrained our fellow citizens, taken captive on the high seas, to bear arms against their country, to become the executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by their hands. He has excited domestic insurrections among us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an indistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit 
to be the ruler of a free people, nor have we been wanting in attentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our immigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They, too, have been deaf to the voice of justice and of consanguinity. We must, therefore, acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are, and of a right ought to be, free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Welcome to the Hardcore Patriot. Oh, it's gonna be fun. We can stay up late, swap the manly stories in the morning. This is dangerous, son. You gotta know how to handle it. One wrong move and you're done for. And now, here's your host, Alan Ray. Happy 241st birthday, America. I am Alan Ray, the Hardcore Patriot, and welcome to my Independence Day special. I hope that you took the time to enjoy that track. That was none other than John F. Kennedy reading the Declaration of Independence as it was passed. As it was given to King George, as those defiant ruffian Americans in 1776 thumbed their noses at the British and said, guess what? We don't bow to a king anymore. We were created equal. We don't give in to royalty. We are united. These United States, United Colonies. And with that paper, with that signed ink, we became the United States of America. Yes, a long and bloody battle ensued. One that took the lives of many. One that cost in money, lives, limbs, weapons. But today, we celebrate that 241 years later. Hopefully, you are celebrating this correctly. And there is, believe it or not, from day one, there has been a correct way to celebrate the 4th of July. Who but John Adams himself wrote back home to describe what should happen on this day and allow me, the hardcore patriot, to actually read his texts. His letter to Abigail Adams, dated July 3rd, 1776, read in part, But the day is past, 
The second day of July, 1776, will be the most memorable epoch in the history of America. Yes, I said July 2nd, 1776. I am apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the Great Anniversary Festival. It ought to be commemorated as the Day of Deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. It ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade, with shoes, games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires, and illuminations from one end of this continent to the other from this time forever forward. Hmm. And by shoes, by the way, that's not S-H-O-E-S, that's S-H-E-W-S, shows. Yep. I say it again, it's to be solemnized with pomp and parade, with shows, games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires, and illuminations from one end of this continent to the other from this time forward forevermore. You see, the Declaration of Independence was transposed on the next day, which we now celebrate. Of course, it would take weeks for all the delegations to sign it. But Adam's wish took effect the next year, with illuminatory celebrations in Boston and Philadelphia on July 4, 1777, according to American University professor James Heinz, who compiled a massive historical account on the 4th of July. To commemorate the country's first birthday, Colonel Thomas Crafts, one of the Sons of Liberty and a Tea Partier before it was cool, lit off fireworks and shells over Boston Common. Meanwhile, in the nation's then capital, Philadelphia, the celebration began with ships parading down the Delaware River, firing their cannons 13 times in honor of the original 13 colonies. After an elegant dinner prepared for the members of Congress, in which each toast was followed by a discharge of artillery and small arms and a suitable piece of music, the night ended with the ringing of bells and a grand exhibition of fireworks. Heights quoted a local newspaper that reported, The face of joy and gladness was universal. In 1783, Boston became the first city or town to designate the 4th of July an official holiday. Needless to say, Adam's wishes for pomp, parade, shows, games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires, and illumination have been satisfied ever since. Thank you, Nick DaCosta Clippa, for that article that I just read. Um, what a fascinating history of the July 4th, our Independence Day. I hope you're celebrating it correctly. We are. I know we're going to have the bonfire part. We're going to have the shows part. We're going to have the illuminations because, believe you me, I just went out <laughs> uh, Saturday and I spent all kinds of money on illuminations. And we're going to light up the sky around here in the southeast corner of the cornfields of Michigan. I hope you're going to do the same. I'm Alan Ray, the Hardcore Patriot. I'll be back in just a moment, and we're going to get into this show. You know, before we get going too much further, I want to welcome you. Thank you for spending a little time with me, Alan Ray, the Hardcore Patriot. Uh, this is a Independence Day special, and I'm glad you've taken a little time out to help celebrate with me. We're going to do quite a few things on the Declaration of Independence, the birth of our nation, the Founding Fathers. But first, I want to start out by sharing with you about eh, a few things that are kind of odd history about the Declaration of Independence. 
Do you know the Declaration of Independence was not signed on July 4th, 1776? On July 1st, 1776, the Second Continental Congress met in Philadelphia, and on the following day, 12 of 13 colonies voted in favor of Richard Henry Lee's motion for independence. The delegates then spent the next two days debating and revising the language of a statement drafted by Thomas Jefferson. On July 4th, Congress officially adopted the Declaration of Independence. As a result, the date is celebrated as Independence Day. Nearly a month would go by, however, before the actual signing of the document took place. First, New York delegates didn't officially give their support until July 9th because their home assembly hadn't yet authorized them to vote in favor of the independence. Next, it took two weeks for the declaration to be engrossed or written on parchment in clear hand. Most of the delegates signed on August 2nd, but several, Elbridge Jerry, Oliver Wolcott, Lewis Morris, Thomas McKean, and Matthew Thornton signed on a later date. Two others, John Dickinson and Robert R. Livingston, never signed at all. The signed parchment copy now resides at National Archives in the Rotunda for the Charters of Freedom alongside the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Number two, do you know that more than one copy of the Declaration exists? After the adoption of the Declaration of Independence, the Committee of Five, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Roger Sherman, and Robert R. Livingston, was charged with overseeing the reproduction of the approved text. This was completed at the shop of a Philadelphia printer, John Dunlap. On July 5th, Dunlap's copies were dispatched across the 13 colonies to newspapers, local officials, and the commander of the con Continental Troops. These rare documents known as Dunlap broadsides predate the engrossed version signed by the delegates. Of the hundreds thought to have been printed on the night of July 4th, only 26 copies survive. Most are held in museums and library collections, but three are privately owned. And as a side note, and I'm pulling this out of uh, history.com, as a side note, one of those sold back in the 80s for over $8 million. Do you know that when the Declaration of Independence reached New York City, it started a riot? By July 9, 1776, a copy of the Declaration of Independence had reached New York City, with hundreds of British naval ships occupying New York Harbor. Revolutionary spirit and military tensions were running high. George Washington, commander of the Continental Forces in New York, read the document aloud in front of City Hall. A raucous crowd cheered the inspiring words and later that day tore down a nearby statue of George III. The statue was subsequently melted down and shaped into more than 42,000 musket balls for the fledgling American army. How's that, King George? They tore down your statue and they shot British troops with it. I love history. I could just read on and on and we'll get to more of it, but I want to share a few things with you. This should be a time of year that should be more than just cookouts in your backyard. This should be a time of year that they actually stop and reflect for a moment what this nation has gone through. We've made our mistakes. We've done some things that were pretty bad for a nation, but we've also learned from them. We've picked up and we've carried on. Knowing and remembering the history Behind the revolution that led to the birth of a nation is vitally important. And what better resource do we have than the National Archives themselves? And I'd like to read an excerpt from that for you that describes what happened leading up to the Declaration of Independence. The clearest call for independence up to the summer of 1776 came in Philadelphia on June 7th. On that date in session in the Pennsylvania State House, which later became Independence Hall, the Continental Congress heard Richard Henry Lee of Virginia read his resolution beginning, resolved that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connections between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. The Lee Resolution was an expression of what was already beginning to happen throughout the colonies. When the Second Continental Congress, which was essentially the government of the United States from 1775 to 1788, first met in May 1775, King George III had not replied to the petition for redress of grievances that he had been sent by the First Continental Congress. The Congress gradually took on the responsibilities of a national government. In June 1775, the Congress established the Continental Army as well as a continental currency. 
By the end of July of that year, it created a post office for the United Colonies. In August 1775, a royal proclamation declared that the King's American subjects were engaged in open and avowed rebellion. Later that year, Parliament passed the American Prohibitionary Act, which made all American vessels and cargoes forfeit to the crown. And in May 1776, the Congress learned that the King had negotiated treaties with German states to hire mercenaries to fight in America. The weight of these actions combined to convince many Americans that the mother country was treating the colonies as a foreign entity. One by one, the Continental Congress continued to cut the colonies' ties to Britain. The privateering resolution passed in March 1776 allowed the colonists to fit out armed vessels to cruise on the enemies of these united colonies. On April 6, 1776, American ports were open to commerce with other nations, an action that severed the economic ties fostered by the Navigation Acts. A resolution for the formation of local governments was passed on May 10, 1776. At the same time, more of the colonists themselves were becoming convinced of the inevitability of independence. Thomas Paine's Common Sense, published in January 1776, was sold by the thousands. By the middle of May 1776, eight colonies had decided that they would support independence. On May 15, 1776, the Virginia Convention passed a resolution that the delegates appointed to the represent his, this colony in, con, in General Congress be instructed to propose that the respectable body to declare the United Colonies free and independent states. It was in keeping with these instructions that Richard Henry Lee on June 7, 1776 presented his resolution. There were still some delegates, however, including those bound by earlier instructions who wished to pursue the path of reconciliation with Britain. On June 11th, consideration of the Lee Resolution was postponed by a vote of seven colonies to five, with New York abstaining. Congress then recessed for three weeks. The tone of the debate indicated that at the end of that time, the Lee Resolution would be adopted. Before Congress recessed, therefore, a committee of five was appointed to draft a statement presenting to the world the colony's case for independence. And the rest, as they say, is history. When we come back, we're going to study a little bit about what happened to some of the men that actually signed the Declaration of Independence. I'm Alan Ray, the Hardcore Patriot. I hope you stay tuned and stay with me for the next half hour. What really happened to the signers of the Declaration of Independence? What a brave move that was to put your name on such a defiant document, thumb your nose at the King of Britain, and basically declare that he had no more rule over you. What kind of men would do such a thing to create a country? Better yet, what happened to them after they signed it? Well, according to whatreallyhappened.com, they give us a little insight. Five signers were captured by the British as traitors and tortured before they died. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned. Two lost their sons in the Revolutionary Army. Another had two sons captured. Nine of the 56 fought and died from wounds or hardships resulting from the Revolutionary War. 
These men signed and they pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. What kind of men were they? Twenty-four were lawyers and jurists. Eleven were merchants. Nine were farmers and large plantation owners. All were men of means, well-educated, but they signed the Declaration of Independence knowing full well that the penalty could be the death of them if they were captured. Carter Braxton of Virginia, a wealthy planter and trader, saw his ships swept from the seas by the British Navy. He sold his home and properties to pay his debts and died in rags. Thomas McKean was so hounded by the British that he was forced to move his family almost constantly. He served in the Congress without pay, and his family was kept in hiding. His possessions were taken from him, and poverty was his reward. Vandals or soldiers or both looted the properties of Ellery, Clymer, Wall, or Hall, Walton, Gwinnett, Hayward, Rutledge, and Middleton. Perhaps one of the most inspiring examples of undaunted resolution was at the Battle of Yorktown. Thomas Nelson, Jr. was returning from Philadelphia to become governor of Virginia and join General Washington just outside of Yorktown. He then noted that British General Cornwallis had taken over the Nelson home for his headquarters. But that the Patriots were directing their artillery fire all over the town except for the vicinity of his own beautiful home. Nelson asked why they were not firing at that direction, and the soldiers replied, Out of respect to you, sir. Nelson quietly urged General Washington to open fire and stepping forward to the nearest cannon aimed at his own house and fired. The other guns joined in and the Nelson home was destroyed. Nelson died bankrupt. Francis Lewis Long Island home was looted and gutted. His home and his properties destroyed. His wife was thrown into a damp, dark prison cell without a bed. Health ruined, Mr. Lewis soon died from the effects of the confinement. The Lewis son would later die in British captivity as well. Honest John Hart was driven from his wife's bedside as she lay dying. When British and Hessian troops invaded New Jersey just months after he signed the declaration, their thirteen children fled for their lives. His field and his gristmill were laid to waste all winter, and for more than a year Hart lived in forests and caves, finally returning home to find his wife dead. His, child, his children vanished and his farm destroyed. Rebuilding proved to be too great a task. A few weeks later, by the spring of 1779, John Hart was dead from exhaustion and a broken heart. Norris and Livingston suffered similar fates. New Jersey's Richard Stockton, after rescuing his wife and his children from advancing British troops, was betrayed by a loyalist, imprisoned, beaten, and nearly starved. He returned an invalid to find his home gutted, and his library and paper burned. He, too, never recovered, dying in 1781 a broken man. William Ellery of Rhode Island, who marveled that he had only undaunted resolution in the faces of his co-signers, also had his home burned. Only days after Lewis Morris of New York signed the declaration, British troops ravaged his 2,000-acre estate, butchered his cattle, and drove his family off the land. Three of Morris's son fought the British. When the British seized the New York houses of the wealthy Philip Livingston, he sold off everything else and gave the money to the Revolution. He died in 1778. Arthur Middleton, Edward Rutledge, and Thomas Hayward Jr. went home to South Carolina. In the British invasion of the South, Hayward was wounded and all three were captured. As he rotted on a prison ship in St. Augustine, Hayward's plantation was raided, buildings burned, and his wife, who witnessed it all, died. Other Southern signers suffered the same general fate. Among the first to sign had been John Hancock, who wrote in big, bold script so George III could read my name without spectacles and could now double his reward for 500 pounds for my head. If the cause of the revolution commands it, roared Hancock, burn Boston and make John Hancock a beggar. Here were men who believed in a cause far beyond themselves. Such were the stories and sacrifices of the American Revolution. These were not wild-eyed, rabble-rousing ruffians. They were soft-spoken men of means and education. They had security, but they had valued liberty more. Standing tall, straight, and unwavering, they pledged, for the support of this declaration, with firm reliance on the protection of the divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. You know, I often wonder, 241 years later, what have we become? Where are we going from here? What will happen to that spirit of rebellion? 
that we thumbed our nose at royalty. We thumbed our nose at bowing to a king and declared all men are created equal, and yeah, it took us a while. Now, we have grown and we have realized that everyone is created equal. Where do we go from here? What happens now? We see some of the things going on around us and we cringe. Is this what our forefathers had in mind? It's a constant question. Browsing through some material today, I came across something that I wrote five years ago. And I want to read a chunk of it to you today. What happened to the certain unalienable rights that our forefathers fought for when this country rebelled against the oppressive British government over 200 years ago? Why has the last few years seen a blatant and defiant attack against the U.S. Constitution and the amendments? Why is there a movement to actually do away with the Constitution in favor of a more socialistly updated one? Well, to answer that, Let's look at a familiar passage from the Declaration of Independence. You remember that document. It's the one I played at the beginning of this broadcast. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You see, therein lies the problem. It's a question of faith. It's a question of religion. It's a question of, dare I say it, God. How can one believe in certain unalienable rights when one doesn't believe in the Creator that endowed us with these rights? This all makes perfect sense. Think this through with me for just a moment. In essence, evolution as some believe, is the survival of the fittest. It is the dog-eat-dog philosophy. Survival of the fittest knows no rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is simply eat or be eaten. The same people that are pressuring our government into passing many of the laws that do away with our inalienable rights are the same people that banished God from schools from government, from all institutions. These are the same people that insist that the theory of evolution be exclusively taught. And in their minds, thou shalt have no other theories before them. They are the same people that will not stop until we have a totalitarian socialist government scrutinizing every single aspect of our lives and deciding what's best for us at every single turn. But, are they the most powerful? Are they the fittest? A lot of them are. And they want to survive at your expense. You see, if one is a Darwinist, then he or she is convinced that God does not exist. He or she will go to extremes to make sure that any equation containing God is stricken from institutions like the federal and state governments, all in the name of, quote, separation of church and state, which is another major error in constitutional interpretation. Well, if God does not exist in their minds, then it's logical in their minds to conclude that his unalienable rights that he endowed us with doesn't exist either. And this thinking happens to take a whole lot of power away from the power-hungry if God does exist and we do have unalienable rights. Thus, the United States Constitution, which is founded upon the same unalienable rights, is null and void in their eyes, and it should be eliminated immediately. Now the attack against the Constitution and the clamor that it should be changed makes perfect sense, doesn't it? I encourage each and every one of you to roll back to the beginning of this broadcast and listen intently at the words of the Declaration of Independence. You see, when we take the Creator out of our government, we take the validity out of our lives for the pursuit of happiness, for independence, for liberties, for life. And we hand all of those 
freedoms over to the state. That's not what our forefathers had in mind. Those are our rights. They weren't given to us by our government. They were endowed by our Creator. And if we redevelop that attitude, if we reach deep down into our souls and we bring out that thinking once again, I guarantee you the face of our government, the face of this nation will change for the better. Even now as I speak in the UK, in the very place that we broke from to establish our independence as a nation, the state has decided that a child should die against the will of the parents who have the money to bring them here to the United States of America in an attempt to get help for the child that we may be able to offer. Nope, the state has taken that privilege away from these parents. That state has taken the right of these parents to save a life. It is in the hands of the government. That very action should chill you to the bone, should scare you worse than any horror movie ever could. Because if that comes here, my fellow Americans, my patriots, then we have truly lost our liberties. We've truly given our freedom over to a government, to a state. The rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that were endowed to us by our Creator, which our forefathers declared could never be taken away by the likes of a king. It means that we have voluntarily given them away if we allow that kind of action to come here. I know I'm going to cut this short because I'm going to get to the festivities. I hope you have a great Independence Day. Please don't call it the 4th of July. The 4th of July is the date. It is Independence Day. And truthfully, it's Independence Week. Because the week before this and the week of Independence Day are just filled with monumental declarations and signings by brave men, men that I don't think there's very many people alive today that could fill their shoes as far as stamina and bravery in the face of certain death. It is Independence Day. And it's time for us to really look into our souls, into our hearts, into our lives. And take this opportunity, this Independence Day, to reassert our independence. We have the people in place right now in our government that can be pressured to reestablish our freedom, our liberties. But it's up to we, the people, to apply that pressure. This is what self-governance is all about. We have now more than ever in any of our history, we have now the capabilities of directly contacting our representatives. It doesn't take days. It doesn't take hours. It's instantaneous. They have avenues on the Internet that can reach them right on time, right on the floor of the House, of the Senate. Why aren't we utilizing this more? Why aren't we pressuring these people more? I hate to keep bringing up this socialized medicine, but this is going to really, really hurt what our forefathers exited from Britain. The very reason they exited from Britain. It's going to take that all away. It's going to make that null and void. Because, like I said, we're handing our liberties over to a government. One that cannot and will not be there for us in our greatest time of need. Your freedom, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness was endowed by a creator. We need to keep it that way. We need to remain free at all costs. And you see, the fortunate part is these same forefathers 
worked in to our government a revolution, a nonviolent revolution every few years to keep us from tyranny, to vote tyranny out, to overthrow the entire government, if we wish, by the cast of a vote. I want you to think about these things. Don't just cook out. Yeah, enjoy yourselves. Enjoy your neighbors. Enjoy the day. It is a national party. But I want you to take a little bit of time to meditate on the meaning of Independence Day. That being said, enjoy yourself. Stay safe. Stay even more safe around the fireworks, the bonfires, the shows. But have a great day. I'm Alan Ray, the Hardcore Patriot. We'll talk again soon. God bless you. God bless the USA. You can find Alan Ray on Twitter at 2 cynical 65 or at the Atomic Doghouse 1965.wordpress.com. Thank you for listening to the Hardcore Patriot.